Thank you for standing by. My name is Ian, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Schneider second quarter 2024 earnings call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press star one. Thank you. I will now hand the call over to Steve Bindis, Director of Finance, Investor Relations. You may begin your conference. Thank you, operator, and good morning, everyone. Joining me on the call today are Mark Lork, President and Chief Executive Officer, Daryl Campbell, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Jim Filter, Executive Vice President and Group President of Transportation and Logistics. Earlier today, the company issued an earnings press release. This release and an investor presentation are available on the Investor Relations section of our website at schneider.com. Our call will include remarks about future expectations, forecasts, plans, and prospects for Schneider. These constitute forward-looking statements for the purposes of the safe harbor provisions under applicable federal securities laws. Forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from current expectations. The company urges investors to review the risks and uncertainties discussed in our SEC filings, including, but not limited to, our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and those risks identified in today's earnings release. All forward-looking statements are made as of the date of this call, and Schneider disclaims any duty to update such statements except as required by law. In addition, pursuant to Regulation G, a reconciliation of any non-GAAP financial measures referenced during today's call can be found in our earnings release and investor presentation, which includes reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. Now I'd like to turn the call over to our CEO, Mark Rourke. Thank you, Steve, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Schneider call this morning. I will start by offering my perspective on our second quarter results in the context with the current business and freight cycle trends and how we are positioning the strengths of our multimodal platform on the path towards growing revenue and financial returns for our shareholders. I will then turn it over to Dale for his commentary on the second quarter results and free cash generation and the setup for the second half of the year regarding capital allocation and earnings per share guidance. First, I want to thank all the Schneider Associates, especially our professional drivers for their contributions to the progress we made in the quarter. In the second quarter, we delivered solid sequential improvement in earnings and margins across our three primary segments of truckload, intermodal, and logistics by remaining diligently focused on four areas we have the most control. First, delivering an effortless customer experience, which we know resonated based upon the number of customer recognition awards that we recently received. Second, navigating the 2024 shipper freight allocation season with purpose and discipline. Third, optimizing capital allocation opportunities across our tractor rolling stock, chiefly in dedicated intermodal by increasing the ratio of drivers to trucks. And fourth, containing costs across all expense categories. These actions will continue to drive enterprise value, allowing us to seize the opportunities ahead enhance returns as the freight market recovers. Our commercial philosophy is be mode agnostic across our multimodal platform and offer customers the best combination of service, cost, emission reduction, and transit performance that meets their needs. While our offerings are constructed to compete and function independently based upon their unique value propositions, there is considerable enterprise commercial leverage, which is evident in 46 of our top 50 customers purchasing services in all three segments. It is clear that our value is resonating with customers. In the quarter, we received five recognition awards, including Carrier of the Year and Partnership and Sustainability. We are continuously collaborating with our customers, both during and outside allocation events, to ensure that we have a full understanding across their diverse supply chain needs, and we are aligned with what they see ahead. We've been hearing more frequently from customers that they are seeking to secure asset-based capacity, and balance their brokerage mix. We are now approximately three quarters through the 2024 shipper freight allocation season, so let me offer second quarter highlights that I believe are instructive for the forward positioning of our multimodal platform, starting with truckload. 
In our truckload network, we achieved another quarter of modest contractual price gains, and for the first time in two years, spot price in June exceeded contract price. Importantly, spot remained above contract for the full month of July as well. However, we are behind the tempo that we expected in our prior guidance, therefore shifting out the timing of the pricing recovery. In dedicated, truck counts are up 12% year over year through a combination of organic and acquisitive growth. Dedicated represents 63% of the total tractors we deploy in truckload. Sequentially, dedicated truck count was down 1% as new business implementations and existing account growth were offset with targeted asset efficiency actions as well as moderate account churn. Overall, truckload segment margins improved 290 basis points sequentially from the first quarter. We expect further margin improvement for the second half of the year. Moving to our fully asset-based intermodal segment, order counts were slightly up year over year and up 3% sequentially. Growth in Transcon, Mexico, and the West was offset by shrink in the East against the highly competitive truck alternative. While domestic intermodal has not experienced the full benefit of the higher year-over-year West Coast import levels, we have started to see increased port transload activity. Specific to our recent momentum in Mexico cross-border, we recognize double-digit volume growth with the CPKC delivering freight between Mexico and the Midwest at truck-like transit times. We continue to see significant cross-border Mexico growth opportunities as we move forward driven by ongoing manufacturing investment, automotive production, and shippers continuing to build nearshoring into their supply chains. We recently moved into a new location in Mexico City, reinforcing our commitment to build and grow on our longstanding presence, more than three decades worth, and the expertise that we have in that market. Overall, intermodal margins improved 300 basis points from the first quarter results as we continue to heal the network which reduced friction cost, enabling drave productivity gains and fewer empty repositioning shipments. We moved more orders year over year with 10% fewer dray trucks while maintaining our high ratio of drays executed by our company driver fleet. We expect further improvement margin performance in the back half of the year. Finally, logistics margins improved 180 basis points from the first quarter's performance as we competed effectively in the quarter, especially considering the highly competitive brokerage market. Brokerage order volumes contracted 4% year over year while growing 2% sequentially from the first quarter as asset-based brokers are increasingly favored by shippers at this stage of the freight cycle. Power only continued its double digit percentage growth rate both year over year and sequentially as mid to large shippers prefer the value and flexibility of trailer pools. Power only serves to augment the truck globe network needs of our trailer pool shippers. And again, we expect year-over-year volume growth in the back half of the year. We continue to be encouraged by our performance in the brokerage market through these very challenging conditions, driven by our execution and differentiated strategy of our freight power platform, standalone freight generation capabilities, and power only offering. In summary, the quarter saw positive indicators, including seasonal demand, tightening supply during the annual road check event, increased spot pricing, and modest contract price gains in our truckload network. While we are not calling a market inflection just yet, and the sustainability of these trends is not yet proven, there are signs of market improvement which we anticipate will present opportunities as we move forward. So let me turn it over to Daryl for his summary comments on the quarter and a look ahead before we get to your questions. Daryl? Thank you, Mark. And thanks to each of you for joining us this morning. I'll review enterprise and segment financial results and cash flows for the quarter, discuss our capital allocation priorities, and provide context on our refined 2024 EPS and net CapEx guidance. You can find summaries on pages 21 to 26 of our investor presentation, included on our investor relations section of our website. Our adjusted income from operations was $52 million for the second quarter, compared to $107 million a year ago. Adjusted diluted earnings per share for the second quarter was $0.21, cents compared to $0.45 cents in the prior year. Second quarter 2023 included higher gains on equipment sales versus the current period, which represented a $0.04 cent headwind to EPS. As compared to the first quarter of this year, adjusted income from operations increased $22 million, or 74%. 
adjusted EBITDA of 153 million was also 70% higher than the first quarter. The sequential improvements in adjusted income from operations and adjusted EBITDA reflect results of our continued commercial costs and productivity actions and improving market conditions. Truckload revenues for the second quarter were slightly up as compared to the same quarter last year. Results were driven by a dedicated organic growth and contributions from M&M Transport, our most recent acquisition, partially offset by a lower network pricing and volumes. Truckload earnings for the second quarter were lower on a year-over-year basis, primarily due to lower pricing and volume in our network business and lower gains on the sale of equipment. Within our truckload network, revenue per truck per week grew sequentially 3%, which was primarily yield-driven. Our dedicated business continued to demonstrate resiliency and delivered solid performance during the quarter. We're excited about our ongoing new account startups, existing account growth, the creative contributions of our acquisitions, and our new business pipeline. Dedicated saw 2% year-over-year growth in revenue per truck per week, which was largely productivity-driven. In a revenues for the second quarter decreased 3% compared to last year, primarily driven by lower revenue per order. Second quarter 2024 volumes were favorable compared to the same period a year ago. Inamoto earnings were similarly impacted by lower revenue per order, partially offset by improved dray operations, network efficiencies, and cost performance. Volume growth and productivity actions contributed to favorable sequential financial results in the quarter. Logistics revenues for the second quarter decreased 7% compared to the same quarter last year, driven by a lower brokerage revenue per order and volume. Logistics income from operations decreased 13% compared to the same quarter in 2023, primarily due to lower brokers' net revenue per order and volumes. Our strong balance sheet and operating cash flows provide us with the ability to remain committed to our capital allocation strategy. Our asset productivity actions in the first half of the year and capital discipline have facilitated investment in the sectors of our business that yield the highest returns, placing us on a path toward increased ROIC. These efforts have enabled us to be prudent in managing our net capex spend, which was $182 million on a year-to-date basis, and combined with our cost containment initiatives, led to a $94 million year-over-year improvement in free cash flow. While we remain disciplined in our capital allocation efforts, we continue to execute against our Asia fleet objectives and position our businesses for growth. The ongoing focus on these efforts will shape our capex plan for the remainder of the year which is reflected in our guidance of $300 million to $350 million for the full year. During the second quarter, we continue to advance our share repurchase program with $13 million of opportunistic purchases. We also returned $17 million in dividends to our shareholders, which was 5% above the same period last year. On a year-to-date basis, we had strong operating cash flows, and our net debt leverage stood at 0.3 times at the end of the quarter. As Mark laid out, during the second quarter, our targeted actions to restore margins, as well as improving market dynamics, led to sequential progress across each of our segments. We expect to yield the benefits from our ongoing cost and productivity actions and price recovery efforts in the second half of the year, as well as modest seasonality. While we expect both sequential and year-over-year earnings growth in the second half of the year, the effects of lower-than-expected contract price increases in our network businesses and volume impacts of our disciplined approach have shifted the timing of achieving the level of earnings improvement we had previously anticipated. Based on these considerations, we have refined our full year adjusted diluted EPS guidance for 2024 to a range of 80 cents to 90 cents, assuming a full year effective tax rate of 25%. With that, we'll open the call for your questions. At this time, we'd like to remind everybody that to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Daniel Imbro with Stevens Inc. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking the question. Um, over the Morning, past Dan. week, we've heard, we've heard a, a lot of different accounts for pricing and um, in the truckload market and how that's trending. Could you uh, talk about um, what you're seeing in like market tightness into July and how sustainable that is? 
and give any uh, color around the pricing backdrop that you're expecting for the back half in guidance. Yeah, I'll try to unpack that a little bit. Uh, and I think your question was more on the truck load side of the house uh, network specifically. Uh, as, as we mentioned in our, our opening, Dan, we had modest uh, improvement in contract pricing, which is our second consecutive quarter, but less so than we had initially anticipated as uh, we expected that the market to continue to tighten, which we're seeing, uh, particularly as we're seeing with spot pricing now, uh, for the, I think first time in two years exceed our spot, our contract pricing in June, and also very solid performance again in the month of July. So again, too early to call an inflection, but those are those are encouraging signs. We have about a quarter of our allocation season left on the uh, on both our intermodal and, and truck network business, so we'll continue to lean into that uh, in quarters three and four. And we also have other levers that we are mindful of. What's uh, available relative to uh, project work, out of spot price play. We're seeing an increased level of mini bids. So there's a series of activities that we think we can continue uh, to adjust and, and improve the mix of freight across our network businesses in the second half, which is really what's embedded into our guidance. Got it, thank you. And on the intermodal side, um, how has the pricing backdrop changed there? Are you seeing any competitive backdrop stabilize? And uh, you mentioned seeing the freight, like. Uh, as you just mentioned, the freight market's tightening. Uh, how do you expect that to flow through to the intermodal backdrop going forward, as we've seen um, poor volumes pick up and a lot of positive data points on that side of the business? Yeah, Dan, this is Jim. Uh, you have a lot of questions there. I'll, I'll try to answer this. Uh, first is, you know, we look at that market. Uh, I think the, the area to really focus in on is the dray capacity. And you know, as Mark was talking about earlier, is that you know we've we've really focused on improving our efficiency there. We've taken out 10% of our trucks with more volume, so we've become more efficient. That really is the, the most critical asset, you know, in that that business segment. Uh, still have that opportunity to to be able to flex up to meet uh, customers' demand, but that's generally going to be with third parties that come at a premium price uh, to be able to surge up and. You know, that's something that will be required to get from the market. So uh, that's, that's where I really see the opportunity that we'll see pricing move there. We have seen uh, demand increase. Uh, last quarter, we talked about um, IPI, the growth there, hadn't really transferred over to the domestic side. Uh, that started to change late in, in the second quarter, and we started to see more transload activity, and that's continuing through July. Got it. Thanks for the color, guys. As a reminder, when asking a question, please ask one question, and then you are allowed one follow-up. Our next question comes from the line of Jordan Alliger with Goldman Sachs. Your line is opened. Well, Jordan, you're either out or you're on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, now we can. Now. If you asked a question, we didn't hear it. Hello? All right. Uh, we're going to move on to Bruce Chen with Stifle. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, maybe if I could just touch on dedicated here. You know, you've had some nice truck additions so far. Um, if you could, you know, maybe walk us through the outlook for fleet capacity in the back half and, you know, maybe more broadly um, what the implications are there for, for the pipeline and how that's shaping up. Um, and then, you know, just any updates on the competitive environment there in, in the dedicated market. Yeah, this is Jim. Uh, thanks for the question. And, you know, when you look at our, our growth here in dedicated, I think we've held up very well, and, and a big part of that is just our customer diversity. We've been working on that for a number of years. Uh, no customer portfolio represents more than 5% of our enterprise revenue, and we've just been really purposeful and, and remaining balanced around the verticals that we want to participate in. Uh, Mark also talked about some of the efficiency gains that we've had in our dedicated business. Uh, we're still uh, 
believe that we are going to have a couple hundred of trucks of growth this year. Now, some of our fourth quarter startups might get pushed into next year, uh, but it's really a matter of timing there that uh, you know, new customer acquisitions are, are still on the same pace. Our pipeline remains strong. I still see a lot of opportunities to grow there. And then just as far as any competitiveness that you're seeing, is that starting to abate at all, or is that more or less consistent with where it's been so far? Yeah, I'd, I'd, what I'd say in terms of competitiveness, most of our losses aren't to a competitor's dedicated solution, but it's rather going back to some sort of network solution or a private fleet. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, moving from dedicated to network, that's something that might provide a customer a, a short-term opportunity, but that's not likely to provide value in a stronger market. And so those customers that switch from dedicated to network really provide an opportunity for us to grow with them, but we would approach that differently in a stronger market condition. Yeah, Bruce, maybe as it relates to the competitive context, you know, dedicated is competitive. Um, I guess we wouldn't be a proponent of the, of the narrative that is uh, – any more competitive this year than it's been the last several years. So, you know, based upon the, our targeted audience that we're after on specialty type dedicated solutions and, and the mix of freight uh, or the mix of customers that um, we are pursuing, um, you know, we're still very, very bullish on its prospects, uh, not only including our legacy dedicated, but the growth opportunities within the unique uh, sectors that our recent acquisitions deployed. Now, I still think we have some efficiency opportunities, particularly with uh, one of our uh, recent acquired companies that we can grow the business and do it so more efficiently with the capital base. We'll continue to lean into those. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, we're not uh, of, of the opinion that it's that it's had this incredible step level change in competitiveness. Okay, that's great. Really helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tom Wadowitz with UBS. Your line is opened. Uh, yeah, good morning. Wanted to see if you could offer some thoughts on how we should model or how we should think about uh, revenue per load in Intermodal in 3Q and then revenue per truck per week in network in 3Q relative to 2Q. Is there, you know, is there some impact from contract rates lower that cause sequential pressure? Or did you hit the, uh, you know, the trough in 2Q when it's uh, stable sequentially? Yeah, Thomas, Mark, I'll, I'll open it. If Jim has anything to add, I'll, I'll let him do so. Certainly that the stabilization of intermodal, we haven't seen as of yet uh, material changes to contract rates. We've changed our mix. Uh, you'll see that in our results. We've been more efficient, uh, healing the network, less of the friction costs that impact our profitability, uh, our commercial teams and our operation teams done a really nice job of executing, particularly our dray drivers. So that, that's where we've seen the lift. I think contract pricing uh, is more in front of us. There's generally a bit of a lag to truck on that. So, um, so we, we don't obviously guide specific metrics to quarter. Uh, so that's Kind of really was a setup for the first or the second quarter. We continue to lean in and, and are encouraged, maybe Jim, with some of the discussions for planning for the second half of the year with customers that may be a little different than we experienced the last couple. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, really, the advantage of remaining disciplined through the freight allocation season is that we can flex our capacity to where we have the best opportunities outside of the, the contract season. And so I just feel like we're well positioned to pivot wherever we see quality demand. We have a really broad portfolio of services, which helps us uh, provide solutions to customers. Um, but, you know, we have opportunities to uh, uh, be able to flex to where, where we see the best uh, profitability. Yeah, I guess the only other thing, this is Daryl, that I'd add, is, uh, you know, obviously what we saw in the second quarter was a lot of productivity improvements. Mark talked about tightening of our driver-to-truck ratios. We expect that to carry forward into the second half, so we expect incremental improvement in the second half as it relates to the first half, and a lot of the growth that we expect uh, also is volume-driven in intermodal. Okay, yeah, that's great. And just for the uh, follow-up, I think it was about a year ago that you did a, a nice dedicated acquisition. Um, I think, uh, you know, Daryl, you mentioned the, the balance sheet leverage, which is very low, so that's nice to... Uh, you know, sleep well at night, but I'm, I'm wondering if, um, 
you know, if you decide to, uh, you know, consider using the balance sheet a bit. And just thoughts on timing for acquisitions, you know, if this time of the cycle when there's been a lot of pressure, if that's, you know, gives you more opportunity to find, you know, attractive deals, or if it's just tougher to find things that you might want to buy, you know, obviously it seems like you, you could do deals if you wanted to. Yeah, no, good, good question, Tom. And I'd say this is a good position to be in, right? Just to say 0.3 times net leverage. Uh, so we are conservative and there's a reason that we're conservative because it puts us in a position to be flexible when the opportunity arises. Uh, so if the right strategic opportunity comes up or if there's something transformative, we'll obviously look at it. Uh, but we intend to remain investment grade. I couldn't see us going above two times, uh, but there's a big way to go between 0.3 times and two times, and we're looking at things all the time. So I think just for reference, every 12 to 18 months, we'd expect to do something uh, from a more programmatic uh, perspective. So we've been doing that over the past several years. So for modeling purposes, you could assume uh, you know, that, that will continue. But we're always looking in the market for things that add to our strategic uh, portfolio and our initiatives of dedicated intermodal and logistics. Great. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Tom. Our next question comes from the Jordan Alliger with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for giving me a second chance. 21st century phone problems. Um, anyway, uh, on the logistics uh, brokered side of the equation, um, actually fared a bit better than we thought. Are you reaching a point where there's a little bit more um, normalization in, in, in brokerage? Um, are, you know, curious what you're seeing. You know, in, in your own experience in terms of selling price versus cost of transportation and is there actually any spot market sort of developing thanks i think in general uh, as we talk to customers as we mentioned in our opening jordan it, it, it does feel that the asset-based players uh period but also asset-based brokerage are more in favor uh, and the power only offering uh, that, that we also have an additional opportunity there is is resonating not only with the area community but uh, the customer community. So the spot market, we made really disciplined and we, we have our tools that uh, we try not to make that a hobby where we lose money on individual loads. It happens, but it's constantly being calibrated. And so uh, we're very comfortable giving a volume uh, for a margin uh, as it relates to, to, the, to the spot market and uh, which is generally what we play into our, our brokerage piece. But I, I would tell you it's, it's, more stable at this juncture. I wouldn't say it's accelerated, but uh, both on the carrier costing side and the pricing side, it is stabilized. And uh, continue to look uh, forward to, to producing positive, consistent positive earnings results quarter after quarter in our uh, brokerage business. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ravi Shankar with Morgan Stanley. Your line is opened. Uh, thanks, morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of follow-ups here. Uh, one is just in the point of you've uh, shifted your timing on the expectation of the inflection of the cycle. Uh, can you just confirm from, from when to when? Kind of, is this something that's moved to like one Q25, two Q25? Kind of, when do you think that happens now? Uh, and second, just uh, historically, you guys have given us some pretty good color on uh, peak season, how that's shaping up. Uh, any sense of what this year looks like? Um, Ravi had a hard time maybe catching all of that first one. I think maybe uh, you were looking for a declaration of uh, when the inflection might occur. Um, you know, we're not declaring that at this juncture, probably a little bit early for us to be projecting out to 2025. Um, so I'll, I'll stay away from a, a prediction there. It's been incredibly difficult to do through this uh, most recent cycle, so, so we'll uh, stand down on that one. As it relates to color towards peak, um, you know this is the this, this season that we're in the early stages of working with customers and trying to understand kind of how they're seeing the world. Um, I think we do believe that customers in general will need to have volume uh, for their sales. They've been very successful at price over the last couple of years, but I think volume will come back as an increasingly a lever. And we've had a bit more discussions this year, Jim, maybe just some context of 
um, how that plays out by, yeah, by just, our, our most recent discussions. Yeah, and just a little context, and you think about what we went through in the, the first quarter, there were a couple of pockets of tightness, and you know, the market uh, dropped off a little bit in between this time, and those pockets of tightness of, of road check, and then end of quarter and the holiday. Um, but what you didn't see in between each one of those is necessarily the same degree of tightness. And just to, and, and Mark also mentioned the more mini bids. All these are indications that supply and demand are coming more into balance. And so we're, we are hearing more from customers that want to start talking to us about what is our capability to surge, uh, how would we do that, what options can we bring to the table. And so we're having those discussions. There's nothing definitive yet in terms of how much they're going to ship in, in days, but we, you know, just the fact that we're having those discussions this year, and uh, that really wasn't the case last year. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Ossenbeck with J.P. Morgan. Your line is opened. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, so, morning, Jim, Brian. maybe you can. Hey, good morning. Uh, maybe, Jim, you can elaborate a little bit more on the the IPI, the international intermodal. It sounds like you're seeing a little bit of spillover into transloading uh, on the domestic side, so I don't know when that would necessarily uh, hit the network, if, if that's uh, kind of in line with expectations or, or volume that you're expecting, and whether or not that accelerates from here, or if it's still kind of a, a slow and steady um, Still in steady progress as opposed to maybe picking up into the peak. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, so, you know, we were talking about this last quarter on our call that we were anticipating that we would start to see this just because of some of the tightness with, with ocean uh, capacity. And it, it really didn't start, uh, we didn't start feeling it until very late in the quarter. Uh, and that has carried uh, through July. We just we have not seen a drop off in that, so I'm not sure that I, I could say that you know when are we going to see more or a bigger peak. That that's difficult to uh, make an assessment of how much more we will see there. But we've definitely seen that that change that with that tightness of ocean vessel capacity, they're making that decision to to switch from IPI to domestic. Yeah, problem as we went through the quarter. Um, you know, solid growth in Transcon, Mexico, and the Western region. Unfortunately, we had some some offset out in the east uh, due to the truck capacity. But some of those key intermodal markets, we did see uh, some improvement. And uh, as we get to the the busier part of the season, we we would expect some uh, what we what we're calling return to more normal seasonality, not peak, not inflection, but more normal seasonality. Understood. Uh, just to follow up on intermodal, then, in terms of where the truck market is, sounds like it's still challenging uh, in the east. Where are the spreads relative to history right now? And, and are you having shipper conversations where they're looking to do more conversion now that rail service is stabilized and improving? Have you seen anything notable uh, in the quarter so far? Yeah, this is Jim. Uh, yeah, from a service standpoint, that really has not been a, a barrier here. Uh, seeing great service from all three of our rail partners. Um, so it really is a matter of price relative to over the road. And uh, here more recently, as we're, we are seeing the truckload rates start to slowly increase, it's putting intermodal in a position to compete there. So uh, that's something I would expect that we'll start to see uh, a little bit of an improvement, especially uh, in those truck competitive lanes. Okay, thank you for the time. Our next question comes from the line of Chris Weatherby with Wells Fargo. Your line is opened. Yeah, hey, thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, I was wondering if you could dig in a little bit into the July commentary and, and maybe sort of compare it to what you'd normally expect from a seasonality perspective. You know, some fairly negative macro data out this morning. I guess I'm just kind of curious how you guys compare and contrast what you've seen over the course of the last several weeks in the business. I know you mentioned that spot rates are still above contract, but you know, broadly speaking from a demand perspective, is it playing out the way that normal seasonality would suggest? Yeah, Chris, from, um, 
for my expectations and, and normalcy, obviously it's a little bit of a shorter month coming uh, with a major holiday in it, but I, I wouldn't say there was anything particularly unusual in, in either direction. It's been uh, fairly steady, which is a, I think overall a good sign coming off end of quarter in June. So uh, not spectacular, but uh, not a reversion back to you know much less lower volumes or pricing changes, as I mentioned in the spot market. So pretty steady, pretty steady performance. Okay, that's helpful. And then maybe just putting all of that into the context of um, the guidance, I think you guys mentioned that you'd expect sequential improvement in, I think, year over year in earnings in the next couple of quarters. Any other sort of shape you can put around that? I guess maybe the direct question is, you know, what will your expectations be around the fourth quarter that can have some more significant seasonality? So just trying to get a sense of maybe how to sort of pace out the rest of the year from an earnings perspective going towards your updated guidance. Chris, I think you've, you've kind of hit on the kind of how we're thinking about it. We did, we, we are talking sequential first half, second half there. Uh, and when we use, use the phraseology of more normal seasonality, again, that, that would indicate uh, that fourth quarter is generally more favorable than third quarter. And that's what we would expect uh, normal seasonality to be defined as. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks very much for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of John Chappell with Evercore ISI. Your line is opened. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So good morning. You spend a lot of time, I think, on the inter on the intermodal side. You've talked through um, some of the cost initiatives. I think in detail, it's a really interesting read to see most of the revenue lines effectively flat sequentially, and then a doubling of EBIT in every revenue line. I'm sorry, in every uh, segment line. So. On the TL and, and maybe the logistics side too, is there any more detail you can give around the cost initiatives that you've implemented to enable the margin to expand so much, even in a flat revenue backdrop? Yeah, good question. And, and as as we've spoken in our last several calls, uh, and if we baseline ourselves to the fourth quarter of 2022, which is where we've typically uh, discussed this topic, I, I'm just really proud of the entire organization's ability uh, across multiple expense pools to, to dig in and look for opportunity to arrest inflation and now in many cases be able to turn back uh, some of those costs uh, to inflation, Jonathan. So it really is really is across the board and, you know, from our maintenance organization on uptime on equipment to, you know, getting the parts and all the things that was uh, inhibiting our ability to be low cost and high uptime, they've done a really good job of getting us back to what we would consider our standard spec, our driver recruiting teams, uh, our headcount actions to be more efficient. We've talked about capital efficiency by being able to increase ratios. You know, all of those, you're not hitting, uh, you know, a one bounce uh, double over the fence. You're hitting lots of singles across lots of categories uh, to build momentum. And, um, you know, we, we're talking about how those are structural improvements. Those don't have to change based upon market and so um, you know really really across the board from uh, third party expense to to in-house uh, dollars uh, the team has leaned into and that's why you see it really prevalent across all three of our operating segments it isn't in a single or or, or targeted part of the business it's really across the board yeah then this just really is a, across the enterprise like mark said and mentioned all the places we've taken cost out the value of remaining disciplined through that allocation season is we've been able to you know get a better mix of freight on, and that better mix of freight helps us reduce some of the friction costs uh, that also plays in so it really is an enterprise action mm -hmm. jim that leads right to my follow-up which was the um, mix of freight are you effectively saying that you're walking away from business that's maybe lower margin or requires greater resources than the return you can get on it at this point and does that change the kind of uh, trajectory that you would see when the when the prey headwinds do become tailwinds yes john uh absolutely that we are uh, posi positioning ourselves to uh, align with freight that that you know generates a return for the organizations that we can reinvest I would expect that in a different market cycle, those are opportunities that become available again and create opportunities for growth. 
Yeah, that's, there, there are multiple lever, levers there. How we um, accept freight, how we use the spot freight, uh, giving ourselves the flexibility to go after in the event that it's their more premium project work, all that's behind our decision relative to what uh, we're making commitments and what we mean by discipline through uh, the allocation season, Jonathan. And I, I just don't, do want to reinforce the good work our, our sales and commercial teams doing. Uh, and we've used the example here today on Intermobile by getting the network in a better position, healing the network. We have less of the accessorial costs. We have less of the repositioning costs. And it's enabled our driver fleet to be more efficient, which has allowed us to take capital out of uh, of the business and the corresponding expense that we save by doing that. So um, the, the commercial healing relative to this allocation season has the cost benefits in addition to uh, giving us additional flexibility in the event that we have the opportunity to, to yield it in the second half of the year. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jim. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Seidel with TE Company. Your line is opened. Hey, Mark, Jim, team. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on um, sort of the back half of the year, what you're hearing about peak season. You know, you, you mentioned that, you know, you, you kept a lot of capacity um, to be more flexible. Um, are we expecting a lot more sort of pop-up business in the back half of the year? What are shippers telling you? Well, I'm not sure the definition, we've kept a lot of extra capacity. What, what we've done is given ourselves the flexibility uh, to the degree that we can to help our customers who may uh, need that type of uh, support. And we're in some discussions, and we have been in discussions, trying to understand what that may look like. Um, and so what we're really uh, trying to do is make sure that we can pivot appropriately and have the resources and the aptitude to do that, uh, Jason. So a little early for us to be definitive on that. Um, but uh, that's the point of the planning process that we internally are in and also in conjunction with our customers. Okay, fair enough. Um, and on the dedicated side, have you guys seen the more aggressive marketplace in terms of pricing um, on, on the contract side? It seems like, you know, some of your competitors have, uh, have, have taken some trucks out of their dedicated operations as, uh, as we look at some of the TQ numbers. Well, as in, in any market, there are a distribution of, of type of, of freight that you're hauling, even in dedicated and customer segments. We uh, are are in the more generic um, dry van type dedicated in certain locations and certain geographies, but increasingly what our focus has been, where our growth has been, both organically and acquisitively, uh, Jason, is we're trying to certainly position ourselves in the more durable dedicated, those that... Uh, that we're providing a specialty in their equipment or additional service that our drivers involved in the supply chain process for the customer. And as such, there's, I wouldn't say there's less competition. I said there's plenty of competition there, but it's much stickier, harder to replace, and you're really uh, demonstrating your value to your customer every day. And if you do that, uh, your retention levels remain high, and, and we're still well, as we sit here today, at 95% plus through our uh, retention actions this year. So. Not that we're not we're not immune to some of the uh, behavior that may may take place, but it's a much much smaller portion of our portfolio. No, that, that makes sense. And, and and what percent of your accounts would you in dedicated would you consider more durable? Uh, well, the vast majority. Um, I'd probably put that in the eighty percent at least. Okay, fantastic. Appreciate the time, gentlemen. Our next question comes from the line of Bascom Majors with Susquehanna. Your line is opened. To follow up on Jason's first question, you noted that it's a little early to really know what you have for peak season. Typically, how far into the calendar would it be before you really know what you're dealing with from a price pop-up demand and, and ultimately profit perspective for the fourth quarter? Yeah, that's from this is this is Jim, and typically uh, the process is that we're, we're uh, customers come to us, they have a general idea, we start sharing information. It's not until later in August that they're they're really starting to put together those plans. Uh, there's some of those that are actually already completed, uh, but the vast majority those are getting worked uh, here later in August, and, and some of those actually move even into September. 
Thank you for that. And looking beyond the peak season from this year, you know, as we think about the bridge back in the truckload segment from call it mid single digit operating margins today to your 12 to 16% long term range, you know, is it really just a couple of years of price above inflation that gets us there? If can you kind of walk us through the, the 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 how we get back there without necessarily trying to put a hard cyclical timeline on it? Um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, certainly um, very important is is price recovery. As an industry, we went through a period of inflation. Uh, around wages, equipment that is part of the business today. And what we've been through, particularly in the network side of the businesses, is that not uh, getting compensable rates to cover that, to include what's expected from acceptance, performance, and we're just, the industry and that part of the business, particularly truckload network, at this juncture is just out of whack. And and uh, for us to to invest in the future, we have to see some correction there. We're confident that the value is there and and it will take some time but it but as we'll start to give guidance at, later in the year to 2025 we'll be more specific about that bridge uh, but pricing plays a role and but also all the other actions that we're doing today around productivity efficiency cost all of those things are an important contributor to put us in a position to yield those benefits quickly as uh, price recovery becomes uh, more prominent thank you Our next question comes from the line of David Hicks with Raymond James. Your line. Thanks, guys. Uh, congrats on the quarter. Um, we, we've seen morning, some sequential. Good morning. Um, we've seen sequential margin improvement kind of across the board, across segments, as well as outperform season, typical seasonality here in QQ. Um, is that kind of outperformance that we're seeing? I know you expect sequential improvement, but kind of outperformance versus seasonal trends, is that expected uh, for the balance of the year? Just kind of as you we see to kind of seasonality come back and there's still room to attack on, on the cost side of things. Yeah, this is this is Mark. Uh, I we still have the yield of all the cost actions that, that we've been that, that will still be what we believe is certainly durable uh, through the remaining part of the year. And so there's constant ability to kind of feather those in and, and is part of our certainly part of our outlook. Um, and we've also, from a commercial standpoint or a freight standpoint, uh, we keep using the word return to some some normalcy of seasonality. We're not saying we're going to have the peak of peaks, but a, a normal seasonality after we've seen the end of quarter activity in March, the, end, the experience that we had in the second quarter and some of the conditions that we've outlined in our discussion today would suggest, has to play out, we have to see these trends be durable, which again we noted in our opening comments. But based upon uh, those data points, it gives us at least some confidence that we have some level of, of seasonality in front of us, which is the generally in our industry the best part of the year uh, comes through the late third and into the fourth quarter. Okay, that, that's helpful. And then. Last, I was just kind of curious on, as to the weakness in the all other segment um, on the operating income line. It's the first time we've seen that negative in quite quite a while, while re revenue has kind of improved sequentially from 1Q. Um, is this kind of a headwind expected to continue, or should we get kind of back to that regular cadence of good, good question. question? Thank you. Yeah, th this is Daryl, so I'll take that. So just as, as a reminder, what's in other? is primarily the results of our leasing business. So we lease tractors to owner operators and small carriers. Uh, we also have our captive insurance business that's in that bucket, and we have some unallocated corporate expenses there as well. Uh, to your specific question on the year-over-year -year, uh, decline, uh, that's mostly in the leasing business. So if you think about the market conditions and the stress that the small carriers are under, uh, we're seeing that come through uh, in those results. So not really surprising. All right, very helpful, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Scott Group with Wolf Research. Your line is opened. Hey, thanks. Um, can you guys, I know we talked a lot about normal seasonality. Just remind us, what, what's normal seasonality Q2 to Q3, just for the, the various segments? 
yeah, normal seasonality would, would suggest a, a peak peak season. We said a return to a level of seasonality. So a little bit nuanced there, Scott. We're not again calling for an inflection. So again, want to be incredibly clear about that. Um, the the bigger sequential, if if you go to history, is certainly the third to the fourth quarter. Um, but with this with the improved uh, performance in the second quarter and what we're saw so far in July, we think there is some uh, seasonal improvement second to third. We have to see again, see those trends to play out the, um, and the trends that we've seen be sustainable. Uh, but the, the normal seasonality in our business is more third to fourth. And on the equipment side, can you just talk about any gains in the quarter, expectations for gains? And then on the CapEx side, I think it's the second quarter in a row you've lowered it. Um, any thoughts on CapEx next year? Are you focused on a pre-buy, anything like that? Thank you. Yeah, good. Thanks for the question, Scott. Uh, really, the big difference of uh, our guidance for this quarter versus last is the efficiency actions that we were able to take uh, to lessen the need uh, for new equipment. We're not backing off our age of fleet. It, it really became down to an efficiency factor, and, and kudos to our uh, equipment team who've been able to uh, prepare and some additional proceeds to get out and sell the equipment. That said, we don't expect material gains. Uh, we've had very moderate gains, I mean, barely positive in the second quarter, and we're not modeling anything significant at all uh, for the third and fourth quarter. We're moving the equipment, but we're not moving it uh, at uh, a significant gain standpoint. And then as it relates to next year, a little early for us, we're in our planning stages there with our OEMs and what we think makes sense and what, quite honestly, will actually be available. Uh, so we're not convinced there's going to be a large pool of capability of pre-buy, but it's a little early for us to make any comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question comes from the line of Ken Hookster with Bank of America. Your line is opened. Hey, great. <laughs> Good morning, and, and thanks for getting me in here. Um, so Good really bad, interesting Ken. discussion uh, through the morning. Uh, sorry, Mark. Um, interesting discussion through the morning on, on kind of peak, and, and just given the consumer weakness, you know, we hear whatever, McDonald's, Starbucks, P&G, just so many. But you're saying spot is now above contract. So, Mark, when does that happen, right? When does that occur without an inflection? What else do you need to see to call that? I guess in the backdrop where it, it seems like, all the major carriers have now finally decided to take out about 10% of the fleet, right? Which, I don't know, is that the final cleanup that was that was long needed just to get to this point? And, and is that the beginning of the inflection? Well, not speaking for everybody, but certainly for us, it's been hard. Uh, it's been difficult for us to make a case to, to invest in growth in the network business based upon where it was and where it is in the return profile, uh, Ken. So, um, I would not be surprised that that's more of a prevalent theme across the industry, but it's certainly prevalent here. Um, and so spot pricing is really a function of a couple things. First of all, we're, we're disciplined. We're not playing, you know, 20, 30% in the spot rate. So it, it, it's important component for us and it gives us flexibility, particularly as it continues to, if it continues to improve, uh, to be an adder to our yield actions in the second half of the year. So, um, but I do think generally that is a sign. We'd have to see these things, these trends sustain themselves before we'd be comfortable enough to say, okay, we're now into a, a different phase of the market. Uh, but it, it's an encouraging sign nonetheless. And Ken, I'll just add on this, Jim, that this is part of just, you know, being very purposeful in the construction of our portfolio as well in terms of the customers we're aligning with. And, you know, when we're talking about spot pricing, it really is working directly with, with customers is primarily where our spot volume comes from in our, our asset-based business. It's not necessarily the same thing that you're seeing on broker load boards. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think we're, we're hearing maybe more and more of that in terms of load boards not really being realistic in, in terms of what's going on, certainly as you went through the contract bid season. Um, I guess switching over to intermodal for a second, just to wrap up, I guess, in my follow-up, really interesting growth prospects as you gain long-haul share from Mexico. Can, can we see, or can you see, a, a step 
change in your revenue per order as you get longer lengths of haul from Mexico, or is that just still a, a small part of the business and, and it doesn't really impact the overall change? Yeah, there's an opportunity there. And, you know, one thing we're really looking forward to in, in, with Mexico is STB approval of our no, new Southeast to Southwest and Mexico lane. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing that as, as early as the next few weeks. And that creates a new corridor for there. Absolutely you're right. That has an opportunity to um, provide a little bit of lift on rate per order, as does, you know, in the UP last time we talked about uh, the change in transit times uh, between LA and Chicago, that, that largest intermodal lane that's out there, we've seen that improvement in transit times. I think that's an opportunity to be able to grow. Uh, so, you know, there, that creates a little bit of opportunity to see a little bit of lift of rate per order, but we're not going to slow down in the east uh, because that is also, uh, you know, a great opportunity for us to grow our, our intermodal assets and, uh, you know, believe that as the market starts to change, that's where we would expect to see some growth as well. So it's difficult to say with that entire mix, uh, specifically the lift on, on rate per order because the East is a really large part of our, our portfolio. Understood. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's conference call. We now disconnect. Have a good rest of your day.